What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in true crime and promises to deliver a new studio soon. We were working on it today, but the COE, the chief of everything, uh, she had a mild nervous breakdown uh, dealing with 10,000 wires. And don't think it's going to be too fancy. It's not. It's a. Uh, it's very personal. I had something uh, built, and we will debut it hopefully in the next week or two. Uh, so just a quick update on that. Um, tonight we are discussing uh, what has now been dubbed as the Black Widower Trial, uh, Thomas Randolph. He is back in a Nevada courtroom this week for his murder ret- retrial. Four of his six wives wound up dead. Uh, he was acquitted of the murder of his second wife. This is tough to, to follow along with here. You need a, a bit of a uh, chart uh, to figure it all out. But um, he is accused of murdering his sixth wife, a woman named Sharon Cause. Is it Causey or Cause, Detective Ramos? I, I'm not familiar with this case. I, I thought we were doing the Margaret Rudin case i'm not familiar with the one that you're discussing right now oh okay this is uh well that's not good <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna get some very unbiased opinions then this is good yeah <laughs> so we're gonna get some very fresh, unbiased fresh opinions, but i'm gonna get you in the loop real quick um we'll have to have a word with steve cohen on that but uh it's funny that's the first <laughs> time that's ever happened but uh this is a las vegas case and uh, i will i will I'll, i will lead the way then so okay. Um, we will go with Causey because she spells her name C-A-U-S-S-E, unless someone in STS Nation has a better pronounce- pronunciation. And uh, the question now, uh, this guy, Thomas Randolph, uh, he was uh, convicted of this crime and is being retried <clears throat> because of uh, some bad evidence that came into play, which we're going to ask Timothy Jansen about. Uh, but best guess, now Detective Phil Ramos is like, get me out of here. But this guy is a seasoned investigator. No, so no, he's... No, no, no. <laughs> He'll it, be able to ride along. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, this, the, the Thomas Randolph, the name rings a bell. I'm not, I can't say that I know exactly which case he's talking yeah. about, but uh, I'm sure I could, I'll pick up on it as we discuss it. Yeah, he's a creepy looking white, long white haired guy in a wheelchair now. And he's been in the Las Vegas area for many years. But let me tell the audience about you. You are a retired senior homicide detective with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. 35 years of service. Uh, The last 15 of those were on homicide. Uh, Detective Ramos's assignments include 12 years undercover detective in narcotics and organized crime. Uh, He tried to infiltrate the Cuban mob at one point. This is the stuff of movies. Uh, He was an instructor in the academy, um, a court-certified expert in major crimes investigations. He's a three-time officer of the year, a native Las Vegan, and he was there for the Tupac Shakur autopsy. And you can confirm he did die, right, Detective Ramos? He sure is. Well, he's as dead as they come. (laughs) And Detective Ramos also... Loves riding his Harley. And then we've got, you know him well, famed Tallahassee defense attorney R. Timothy Jansen. He's a partner uh, in the firm Jansen and Davis. He's handled all kinds of complex civil administrative and criminal litigation. He's also spent five years as a federal prosecutor. No one knows Tallahassee or the legal world the way Tim does. A fantastic lawyer. Last but not least, you got Robin Dreek a best-selling author, professional speaker, a trainer, executive coach, a podcast host, a Marine Corps officer, a retired FBI special agent. That should really go up front. And he was chief of the counterintelligence behavioral analysis program. One of his many jobs was recruiting spies. He's author of The Code of Trust, and it's not all about me, which my mom wishes uh, I named my book, uh, gave it that title. Um Mary Griffin, right out of the bat, and I'm glad you asked. Is Phil Waters okay? And I'm glad uh, it is devastating what's going on uh, out in Hawaii. 36 people dead in Maui. We have Detective Phil Waters, who solved over four or worked on over 400 homicide cases with like a 93% uh, success rate. He spends his summers in Hawaii, and I just texted him. He is okay, a bit rattled. They had the roads closed, uh, even on his island. He's about 10 miles away from Maui, uh, but he says it was uh, very ominous looking out there. 
Um, so uh, a scary situation. So uh, please follow us on Facebook, Insta, Twitter. We are at Podcast SCS. You can also listen to us anywhere you listen to podcasts. You can support us at Pat- uh, Patreon and YouTube. And of course, the merch store is open. So uh, now that I'm finding out live on STS that Detective Ramos is not that familiar with this case, it's 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 interesting in a way because now we are going to get a fresh set of eyes and ears on this. So he is a 68-year-old former death row inmate. His conviction was overturned in 2020 uh, for the murder of his sixth wife. Uh, he had allegedly murdered his wife and then also killed the the handyman who he hired. Uh, he claimed that there was an intruder. We'll get into all the details. Uh, he is no longer subject to the death penalty uh, in this retrial that just started. Um, he did stand trial originally, as I said, six years ago. Uh, but the Nevada Supreme Court reversed this decision because of prior bad evidence. Tim Jansen, uh, what does that mean, really? Uh, this has to do with the murder of his second wife, of which he was acquitted. And was it the right decision, in your opinion? Well, for in federal system, it's called 404B evidence. If someone commits a crime, similar uh, manner, mode and stuff, you can use that to show the jury that, he, that this crime is consistent with that crime. But there are, are factors that have to be. It's got to be. It can't be too remote. It's got to be similar, and it's got to be clear and cons- convincing evidence that the person committed the crime. It's really hard for a judge to weigh everything uh, to determine that because it can be very prejudicial in a case. It's like they're saying they punished somebody for something they got away with before. It's hard to tell if the jury is convicting them for that prior bad act or what's at bar. In that case, they introduced evidence that he was acquitted on. It's really interesting because he hired somebody to commit this crime, to come in and rob the place, kill his wife, and then leave. And then that person, I guess, flipped. And then he tried to hire someone to kill the guy he had the conversation for. He got convicted of tampering with the witness. But then when his trial came, he got a not guilty. So when it came to his, I guess it's his sixth wife or fifth wife, they tried to introduce all that testimony in. Yeah, six he was, wife. Six yeah, wife. he was acquitted of it. And then they had hearings this week. I was watching them. And they put this guy up, another guy. He said he had a conversation. He couldn't say 25 to 50 years ago. But what he was describing was exactly what happened in this case. Mm-hmm. You come in, pretend like you're going to rob me or kill her, and then, and then we'll meet. And they say, well, why didn't you do it? And he goes, well, because I was afraid he'd shoot me next. Mm -hmm. which is exactly what happened in this case. He hires this guy, allegedly, to come in and rob him, somebody he knew, kills the wife, and then he claims it was a masked guy. He didn't know. He shot and killed him. And so he's on trial now. Um, They're not going for the death penalty because the evidence is much weaker. Jurors are much less likely to convict if it's a death versus a life on a circumstantial case. Yeah, and the guy you're talking about who said he didn't want to be hired uh, to be the hitman as a character, we'll get into that a little bit. Um, And that was exactly for the reason Tim just said. He was afraid that uh, this guy, Thomas Randolph, was going to turn the gun on him like he did with his sixth wife. Um, I'm getting a kick out of the fact that Detective Ramos thought we were talking about a totally different subject. I feel badly, but we're we're all good here. Um, On a a broad note, uh, Detective Ramos... um, I live in Miami and, you know, crazy things always happen in, in, in Miami. They say that, you know, every news story has a peg to Miami. I feel like it's the same in Vegas. Um, again, we're talking about a guy here uh, married six times. I, I wouldn't have the energy to do that, let alone plan the murder of a few of them. Um, four of his wives uh, wound up dead. Just on the macro picture, uh, what was it like covering crime in Las Vegas? I mean, you must have seen absolutely everything, right? Yeah, you know, just when you think you've seen everything, something new comes along. Um, But, yeah, we run the gamut here from anything you can imagine. Um, And it's funny, the details you're given on on this on this particular case. When I was working undercover, I was one of those guys that was hired to go kill a lady's (laughs) husband. And um, (laughs) 
you know, we arrested her and did all that. But uh, when I went to go tell the guy, hey, you know, and I, and I looked the part, you know, long hair, beard and all that. And I had two patrol officers with me to break the news to this poor guy. I said, listen, we just arrested your wife. She had hired me to kill you. And I just wanted to let you know that she's not coming home tonight. She's in jail. And he jumped up, got behind his desk and said, how do I know you're not still here to kill me right now? I said, well, these two patrolmen that are here are going to make sure nothing like that happens. But yeah, we get a lot of murder for hires out here, you know, just like any big city does. Um, the thing about Vegas that stands out is we're such a 24 hour town, you know, it, it's anything you want, any time of the day. And, you know, the influx of four to 5 million tourists a month, uh, they bring their own unique set of problems and everybody comes here to act crazy and, and uh, <laughs> do stupid stuff. And, and sometimes they cross the line and, and that's when we get involved. And, and Detective Ramos, you're a native Las Vegan. You've been there your whole life. Has it has it gotten worse over the years? Um, How's it changed? Oh, yeah. That, yeah, there's no question about that. I mean, you know, we're, we're almost to three million here in, in Vegas. And, you know, when I started on the department, we had... Uh, 250,000 people. And with that influx of uh, people coming from all over, um, they bring their own mindset, they bring their own views of, you know, morality or lack thereof. And, and a lot of people think you can come to Vegas and get away with anything you want to get away with. A lot of people still believe that prostitution is legal here in Vegas. It's not, you know, yet, yeah, prostitution is legal in Nevada, not here in Vegas or in Clark County, but a lot of people think that, uh, you know, it's just this, you know, sin city. Everybody comes here to, to take part of all kinds of nefarious activities in sin city until, you know, a large degree, people come here, have a good time and, and walk away with big headaches. And that's about it. But <laughs> every once in a while, they, they, like I said, they cross the line and, um, what happens in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas and they end up staying. Uh, and I, I, I'm sure you have stories for days and uh, I'll probably yeah. uh, ask you a few as we go through this. Uh, yeah. Catherine Regier, uh, thinking of you, she does live in Maui, I believe, right? Catherine, let us know how you're doing. I was thinking of you. Um, I did get what you sent as well. And to be honest, I haven't even had a chance to open, but I will. And I appreciate it. We're thinking of you. And if you need help from STS Nation, uh, please please let us know. It's a good sign that you're watching the show and you've got Wi-Fi uh, considering uh, what Maui just uh, went through. Uh, I am not T-Pain checking in. Um, hey, saying hello to I am not T-Pain. Uh, Robin Dreek. So we're going to get into some of the specifics of this. This guy was married for the first time, I want to say in the mid to late 70s. He has two children with his very first wife she testified and basically said this guy's a horrible person this guy thomas randolph uh very aggressive manipulative all these things uh four of his wives wound up dead two from illnesses one of those is of interesting uh circumstances he wouldn't let anyone into the hospital she died after a heart surgery when he was the only one there and had her cremated within 36 hours. But the, the big question for you is when there's smoke, is there fire? I mean, there, there's no real coincidences. A lot of people say, what do you say? Uh, the fact that four of these six women wound up dead. In my, well, yeah. There's well, always, yeah. there's always fire and smoke together. And yeah. the thing I love doing with behavior in these cases is it's why I wish it's a shame that some of these past things can't be admitted into evidence, you know, like the prior deaths that are surrounding him. It's like the Lori Daybell Vallow case as well. These people create an arc of, of behavior in their lives. It starts early on and it becomes extremely predictable. You know, and if, if you have, first of all, if you have six wives, you, the chances and probability of having a seventh is really high if you're allowed to, <laughs> you know, because again, you know, past patterns and key behaviors are generally predictors of future ones. And if you have death involved with multiple spouses, the likelihood of death involved in a future one is pretty dang high. And suspicious deaths, pretty dang high. The thing that really strikes me about this gold, I was looking this up today, you know, gold digger, serial killer <laughs> type guy. On all the other gold digger type cases, you're right. This, this individual is a little different. 
And when you're looking at his, the way he's involved in the media, the way he's going attention seeking, Mm -hmm. you know, which is, you know, edges up towards those behaviors, psychopathy and grandiosity that we see with, with typical people. But he seems to have this really flagrant disregard for life. And now granted, you know, when murders are, are taking the life of others, they generally have disregard for life, but he also seems to have a disregard for his own life. He doesn't like, if you look, look at him when he's in, in the courtroom and he looked on, on the different channels, you know, the different stuff he's done in the media, he talks about being on death row with the same kind of flatness that he talks with everything, you know, the same baseline, I won't say flatness, but the same baseline. So in other words, I think I, I'm really fascinated. I'd love to know what his belief system is because I think he literally looks like he's regarding this life as a playground and he's trying to get you talked about energy. How does he get the energy to do that? This life is his energy. And part of that energy is just taking lives, disregard for life. Let's just cause chaos because he is thriving on chaos and he loves it. And I don't think he gives a rat's ass whether he dies or not. Mm. Uh, interesting. Very interesting perspective as always uh, from Robin Dreek. Uh, Detective Ramos, I'm going to get back to Tim in a second about some of the legal matters, but uh, and I don't want to put you on the spot, even though I already have just by having you on on a a topic you weren't ready for. Are you familiar uh, with the prosecutor? It's Chief Deputy District Attorney Pamela Weckerly. Yes, know her very well. Very, very good, strong prosecutor. She's been around for a long time. She's prosecuted many of the cases that I've had, and, and she's very, very, very good attorney. Are you surprised knowing her and not knowing this case that well, that she, the state, uh, that she would retry this case, um, you know, after a Supreme Court ruling, Nevada State uh, Supreme Court ruling uh, overturned the conviction, basically. He's still remanded to prison, but um, you're not surprised that they're retrying it, I assume. No, no. And now now that you mentioned that, it's starting to ring a couple of bells. I, I think I was just reading about that case a couple of weeks ago locally here. And um, no, she doesn't back down from anything. Pam doesn't back down at all. And um, I'm not surprised that uh, she attacks it w- the way she does. She's she's very, um, very go-getter when it comes to, she, when she believes that this person is absolutely guilty of committing a murder, a heinous murder, um, she's not going to slow down or stop for anything. Yeah. She sounds tenacious. And, uh, I think you have to be, um, Ashley, a lot of people say this dude looks like a lady, not you detective Ramos. We're talking about Thomas Randolph. Um, he's got a creepy, uh, appearance to him. Uh, someone here asking, is he wearing pigtails? Uh, my man Shaquille O'Meal said they hope they gave him a haircut and cleaned him up. I think they did clean him up a little bit for the trial. Uh, Tali here is checking in from the Holy Land, from Israel. Uh, shout out to Tali um, and our global audience. Uh, Tim Jansen, to you, um, Diana Johnson, uh, a member for three months. If they get life insurance, run fast, because that's what this guy was going after. He got paid. Um, Tim Jansen, so um, they were supposed to have opening statements today even as early as yesterday but it's not going to happen opening statements will happen on friday uh they seated a jury today um if you are seating a jury in this particular case and you are the defense who are you looking for here Hmm. well i don't know nevada that well um they're keeping out a lot of issues that were the most damaging to him which would have been the prior murder um they did. The judge did let the walkthrough in, which I think might be where he actually speaks and he describes the robbery and where the people were and how it how it occurred. That could be the most important evidence for for both sides, because now the defendant doesn't have to testify. He's not subject to cross examination, but it could be helpful to the prosecution because they're able to describe what he's describing and the officers can say, well, you know, that's just not consistent with the evidence, the blood splatter, how the bodies, it just couldn't have happened that way. So picking a jury, um, you probably don't want a lot of females, but I don't know how many of them are going to know how many of his wives died. They might just, they might just only know about this murder. And he's going to say, this guy came in with a mask and he shot my wife and I grabbed my gun and shot him. So 
obviously you're going to want jurors who maybe are distrustful of the police, distrustful of um, law enforcement, uh, want want to have that smoking gun because this looks like it's going to be a circumstantial case evidence. Um, certainly more liberal people, like get teachers on there. Um, that's who I'd be looking for. I'm going to get back to that distrustful of police in a minute. Uh, but uh, Detective Ramos, to you, I'm curious if you have ever heard of this, but um, Court TV was reporting, actually it was Law and Crime, my apologies, and one of their excellent producers, Kathy Russin, who should get credit, she was in the courtroom all day. Uh, she tweeted out, an unusual order from the court there in Clark County, uh, we are not allowed, the media, to report the makeup of the jury. I suppose this is normal for this judge uh, and the court, but I've never experienced this around the country. Um, are you familiar with the judge, by the way, is Judge Tierra Jones. I don't know if you know her, um, but in the past, have you have you seen where the media is not allowed to report the makeup of the jury? I've never heard of that ever. Not, not not only here in Clark County, but but anywhere. You know, mm -hmm. when you when you got a major crime like that going to trial, um, I've always always heard. Well, the jury's made up of you know six men, six women, their ethnic background, and and so on. I I can't imagine why. I am familiar with this judge and and some of the decisions decisions this judge has made. Um, but I'm still surprised at, at that. I, I've never heard of it. Tim, have you heard of that? And you're I've never heard of that. I've, I've never heard of that at all. Yeah, it's uh, it seems uh, really odd. Um, the judge, I'll tell you, takes copious notes. I don't know anything about her other than she's a big note taker because I've been watching. Um, 18 of the 13, this is the only information I think that came out, that eight of the 13 jurors are college educated. Court TV reported that. So, um. But Robin Dreek, I'm curious to get your take on this as a guy who studies people. Um, he walked into court today. Um, prior to jury selection, he was coming in in a wheelchair. And this same uh, law and crime producer uh, said, why is he not in a wheelchair today? Because uh, maybe the theatrics don't need to be there. I think this, I mean, what, what does that say about him being very manipulative? That suddenly the jury is seated. Uh, he comes in. Um, you know, what are they going to think of the fact that he's no longer in a wheelchair? 100%. Very manipulative. He's got a life reps of manipulation, of showmanship. When I was watching him do the replay of him shooting the intruder, it was like watching someone in Summerstock Theater. I mean, it was he was right on point with his marks, where he was going, the motions. He was given the nonverbal to someone with a lot of truth and veracity, but then someone says that's completely inconsistent with the ballistics. You know, so it's like he's really, really practiced at what he does, and boy, he loves an audience. You know, whether he mm -hmm. changes his hair or not, I don't think it has anything to do with his looks. He just wants the attention. He loves this attention he's getting. You know, whether he's on death row or not just means he'll get more attention. He's, I believe he's very excited about what's going on and he doesn't care what the outcome is. Detective Ramos, you're, you're an observer of human beings and people just by nature of your profession. This guy is super conniving, super manipulative. Um, and by all accounts from his previous wives, uh, not a nice person. How do you think he got married six times? How do guys like this meet so many women? Wow, that's a good question. You know, the, the, the one thing that's obvious is this guy's uh, narcissistic behavior. It's all about him. Um, you know, I certainly can't second guess a, a woman's choice who she decides that she's going to take up with. But it could be that, that he's he works on his representative being there when when he's trying to date and court these women. And then once he gets them seduced so to speak and his real nature comes out um i'd be very interested to see what the results of his psychological exams are um that could come into play in the trial i i would expect his defense would would uh at least look into that you know his state of mind if you can narrow it down could be very interesting a hundred percent i think he's i almost know he targets these women he yeah he picks the kind that he can control and he marries him because, you know what? If you're not married to the person, you don't collect the insurance. You don't have mm -hmm. an insurable interest. 
most people would stop getting married after four or five times. This guy's benefiting from it. And the, and the wife three, I think she said he fired a gun while he was cleaning it and yep. missed her. Yep. So he, he's wow. building up. Uh, <laughs> and now he's finding fall guys for him. You know, the last one. Yeah. Yeah. Detective Ramos, wife number three, um, claimed that he claimed that he was cleaning his gun and a bullet whizzed by her head. Uh, so uh, the pattern of behavior, uh, we've seen it over and over. Uh, lest you think we are not a global show, all you have to do is see Inform New Zealand. Uh, good morning from uh, what she said the other day, or he said, I don't know. Look at me being sexist here. It could be a man. Um, was a, a chilly New Zealand. So uh, it's beautiful down there. So I can't feel too bad for you. Hi, SAS Nation. Hope everyone is having a great day. Uh, Tim Jansen, uh, defense attorney extraordinaire, back to you on this. You mentioned you would look for someone um, who is distrustful of the police. Yeah. When you are trying to find that person, what kind of questions are you asking in voir dire? Well, I don't know how it is out in Vegas, but you can ask people, what are your thoughts about the police? Do you believe that police officers don't make mistakes? Do you believe police officer it ends justifies the means. Um, you understand people make mistakes, right? Um, and if a police officer comes in here and he doesn't admit a mistake, will you consider that in his credibility? Nobody is perfect. And I, and I always find the hardest police officer to testify is the one that admits to mistakes and says, oh yeah, I could have done this, I could have done that. Because then, you know, this guy's honest. But the guy that's got an answer for everything that police officer doesn't come across. And most experienced policemen understand that. It's the young guys that feel like they have to give the right answer for everything. And it ends up making them look stern, rigid, and not open. Uh, and it just these today with what's going on in politics and with the FBI, and no offense to retired FBI, oh, but their, their, their reputation has taken a big hit, especially the young guys on the streets. And it's not their problem. It's the higher ups in Washington because people feel like now the FBI is political and they're not prosecuting the cases they should. So why should we trust what they're saying? And when I started as a federal prosecutor, when I met the FBI, man, I was impressed. I knew they were trustworthy. And when they walked in a courtroom and testified, those jurors listened to them. Just like Ron, Mr. Romer, an experienced police officer, been around. He knows what he's doing. They're going to believe him. Uh, I've got to let Robin Dreek respond to that since he uh, is retired FBI. <laughs> no, 100 percent. You know, when when the public loses its trust in individuals and most importantly in institutions, doesn't matter how competent they actually are. It's the public trust that's lost. And that's what when the whole systems fall apart. You know, and our our systems have been under assault. And a lot, believe it or not. It hasn't been under assault domestically, although it has been, you know, working in the world of counterintelligence. One of the best things that the foreign actors have done is what their entire objective has always been is so distrust in our government institutions or organizations, because that's when society falls apart. And that's exactly what we're going through. And so, yes. Yeah, so, and whether it's true or not, doesn't even matter. The appearance of partiality destroys 100 percent, just like you were saying. Mm. Um, but it, it is what it is. And all you can do is. And, and, you know, T Tim, you're saying it perfectly is you, you when you have openness, transparency, vulnerability, where you can say what I'm good at, but I'm not going to tell you what I suck at. And I, I and I can then bring competence to the areas that I actually do well on. That's what that's what engenders trust. Mm -hmm. And luckily, there are individuals that do a great job of that so they can bypass the, the negative brand that organizations have these days. I think we're on another swing, hopefully coming back because. Cases like this are too important to let those individual things go by. Um, and by the way, uh, I know I mentioned it, but uh, once again, opening statements for this trial uh, kick off tomorrow morning. So we're going to get a much better idea what the both the state and uh, the defense's uh, positions are. Uh, L.A. Not So Confidential, Dr. Shiloh, uh, one of the best in the business as a mental health professional. And check out her podcast if you haven't already. I have to say this defendant is mentally disordered if he got married six times uh, with the smiley faces there, followed by Tilo out of Boston with the Boston Tude. This guy got six women to marry him. I just can't. Uh, Jersey De Jen Castaldi, thinking of you uh, from my home state. Uh, what a great panel as always. 
Tim Jansen, real quick, and then I've got another question for Detective Ramos um, from I Am Not T. Payne. Is there any chance Thomas Randolph will be charged for any of his other uh, wives' uh, murders uh, if he did, in fact, murder them? Are they still investigating? I mean, he was married beginning in the 70s, but this goes back decades now. Well, he can't be tried for the one he got acquitted on. Double jeopardy precludes it. The one died in the hospital. Uh, he had her cremated. Uh, and they, they ruled that as uh, she died of whatever. The one she died of cancer. Um, if that's the medical report, she died of cancer. Unless someone can go back and say, well, it wasn't. How did she get that cancer? Um, I think it's going to be difficult. Um uh, this case, so I'm, I don't know this judge, and I watched her rulings. I watched the hearings. I'm curious because the big thing on this case is going to be whether she lets the officers testify that the blood splatter was inconsistent with what he described in the walkthrough. They were trying to get them as an expert, and the judge was like, well, that's what we have blood splatter experts for. Well, that's not necessarily true. An experienced officer who's actually done blood splatter or has been at scenes and does rec rec recreations, he could tell if what the guy's saying is true or not. And I think based on their experience, which they have like 50 years, I'm curious how she's going to rule. She said she's going to wait until they testify. Hmm. We will uh, we will find out soon enough. This is a funny comment here from Ketchup, a friend of the show uh, who was in South Florida and now moved, I think, to South or North Carolina. Uh, Phil Ramos might be my uncle. Um, I don't even know Ketchup's real name. So but look what happens. when you come on STS, uh, Phil, you find long lost family uh, <laughs> here by uh, Angel Thighs. Yeah. Angel Thighs? What is that? I thought I said thighs. Uh, hi, <laughs> this whole show is falling apart from the beginning. So this is all good. Just going to have fun. Uh, look at this. My favorite broadcast with the very best guest covering true crime. Thank you, Mona. I needed that. Uh, to avert this disaster, a, a super sticker. Thank you so much. Disasters. You meant to do it like this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, Detective Ramos, uh, on a serious note here uh, with a serious crime, you mentioned psych exams. Um, this guy is, uh, you know, a psychiatrist's uh, dream here because he's probably so convoluted with so many different diagnoses. What sort of things... Um, do psychological exams reveal? Uh, I imagine you've probably read psych reports. I mean, what do they do? How do they go through this? Um, and what do they assess exactly? Well, I think primarily what, what a uh, doctor will try and get to is if this person is able to determine whether his actions were right or wrong and what he was thinking at the time that these crimes were, he was accused of committing. Um, if, if this person is way out there and, and he's diagnosed as multiple personalities and schizophrenic and so on, then he's going to be committed to a state mental facility until he's able to aid in his defense. And uh, sometimes that lasts a few months, sometimes it lasts a few years. Um, and each, each doctor will have his own technique and, and method of trying to get that information for both defense and for the prosecution and, and give as unbiased uh, an opinion as he can as, as, as far as a defendant's mental health, because in the end, that, that's going to be a key for the judge to determine, is this person um, able to, is he fit to stand trial? If he's not, if he doesn't understand the charges against him, if he can't aid in his defense, then this trial could be set aside for a long time. Um, that that came up, obviously, in the Lori Vallow Daybell case, whether she'd be fit to stand trial. There was all kinds of questions about whether she might be deemed unfit at some point uh, during the trial. They, there was no mental health defense. So uh, it's reminding me of all that. Uh, Nightwood is correct here. I read they refer to him as the Joe Exotic of true crime. Um, that is because NBC uh, Dateline did, uh, a, I think, a three-part mini series on this guy. And uh, the, the producer, not the executive producer, uh, who's been around for many years, uh, sort of dubbed him the Joe Exotic of true crime. Uh, so that's interesting. Jersey Jen Castaldi, nothing interesting or Knew about this. Uh, love me some Robin Drake. Who doesn't? Uh, Jersey Jen Castaldi. Um, <laughs> loving on uh, 
I'm Robin Dreek, and look at this. Detective Ramos, we are excited to have you. Uh, FCS Nation, warm and welcoming, even though uh, we pitched you the wrong story, apparently. All good. Um, so um, on the stand, uh, Tim Jansen kind of referred to this, was a guy named Glenn Morrison. This was in pretrial motions, Tim. Mm -hmm. uh, Glenn Morrison uh, testified at the first trial that this guy, Thomas Randolph, this is so confusing. So <laughs> he was acquitted of murder in the second of the second wife. But now this is the fourth wife named Francis. Right. Right. And this guy, Morrison, Glenn Morrison, uh, was recruited uh, to basically uh, put a hit out on her. Um, so he testifies that they were going to stage it as a robbery and uh, shoot Thomas Randolph in the leg. Let me stop it right there. Detective Ramos. So, Second wife is murdered and he's acquitted of the crime. Now, this is a person testifying about the fourth wife. Uh, the M.O. is exactly the same. He's going to hire a hitman, uh, this guy, Glenn Morrison, and they're going to make it look like a robbery. Um, just from your investigative chops, what, what, what does it tell you about this case overall? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with um, it, is the judge going to allow these uh, prior bad acts to come in? Um, during the trial. If so, and, and one would think that it's going to play out in the favor of the prosecution, but sometimes it won't. You know, sometimes the judge will say, no, that, that, that's going to prejudice the jury. They're going to they're going to hear about stuff that they shouldn't be hearing about. A lot of convictions get overturned because of that. Um, but the fact that mm -hmm. this has happened so often and um, if his uh, method of operation was the same on every every prior death, I, I don't see how the judge couldn't let it in. But then again, you know, I'm, I'm not a judge. I'm certainly not a legal legal. So um, that, that's going to be a decision that has to be made by, by people that are much smarter than me about the justice system. And, and the judge will have to make that determination. I would certainly hope that the prosecution is going to try and get that in. And the defense is certainly going to try and keep it out. That's going to be a battle. And, and Tim Jansen, uh, this is your expertise. So the Supreme Court rules against that prior bad evidence. Yeah. Um, what can they now deem admissible in this trial? Because there are these other cases. They can't touch anything uh, from wife number two, I suppose. That's the one where he was acquitted. Is that right? I think that's right. And I, I listened to the guy's testimony. He had no credibility whatsoever. Nice. He was horrible. He couldn't even lock it down between 50 years and 25 years earlier. By the way, let me stop you there for one second. So this guy, because this is sort of funny, actually, and we're having a weird night, so might as well bring it in and have Tim and everyone comment. Um, Glenn Morrison is a guy that was recruited to be the hitman for the fourth wife. The defense asks, did you believe Thomas Randolph slept with your wife? Uh, this guy, Morrison, says, I wouldn't have cared. The defense did you believe he slept with your mother-in-law? Morrison, he probably did. Everyone did. Weird, char <laughs> weird characters uh, in this case. So anyway, Tim, this is a guy you're talking about right now. He just had no credibility. They had no way to verify anything he said. They had no corroboration. And because he, the remoteness, and that's what the judge had to rely on, remoteness is really important in these things. And that Supreme Court said, the farther it away in time, the more prejudicial it is and, and less relevant. So you always want to get it close in time because it shows a pattern. But I also disagree. I agree with Ramos. He's, ex he's describing exactly what happened in this case, but did he read it somewhere? How did he know about it? Um, I don't know the judge. She looked like she was listening. She let everybody speak and she gave her opinion was based on reason. And within the Supreme court that it was too remote. There was no, way to verify anything he said and i can't allow it it's too prejudicial uh maui swift with a question we're all wondering um it's uh, a name we're thinking about tonight with what's going on in maui how did it take six dead wives before they caught on to him robin tree why do we always seem like we're asking this question when repeat offenders um finally get caught we always say, why don't we catch him earlier? Um, this guy's been doing this since like seventies, mid seventies. It's, it's what we see in these cases. And that is 
not all psychopaths have the same intellect. <laughs> and this guy even said that he calls himself a narcissist and proud of it. He calls himself the smartest man. He said, my doctors say I'm the smartest, most intelligent man. I believe he is. And so what happens is, is when people are really, really intelligent and they're also edging a high up on psychopathy and they're going to do these heinous things, they're pretty decent at covering their tracks as opposed to these other idiots that are are luckily getting caught rapidly because they are fools. This guy, it's interesting too, his method of, of killing is very disconnected because you know when you're serial killers, a lot of them want to feel that connection, so you have a lot of strangulation going on. This guy, not only did he were firearms used, but he's trying to hire someone to do it. So there's a lot of disconnect. And so when... That's literally what's kind of edging up towards his undoing is the fact that there's more people involved. Yet he was smart on that. The people he involved are people have no credibility because, <laughs> you know, like the one guy that Tim was saying was was testifying. I think the guy's been in, in either an alcoholic stupor for the last 50 years because he said he was drinking that night, you know, that he's talking about this and he didn't remember what decade it was. I mean, so by the way, the judge uh, ruled on that and will not allow his testimony to be admissible. Right. right. Because, because, uh, you know, <laughs> our killer, our suspected killer or accused killer knows exactly what to do. He knows exactly the people to choose. And my real curiosity of this guy I w they didn't cover. Does anyone know what's his occupation? Like, how did he make a living? Because a lot of times when people are going for the insurance money, it's because they have high debt as part of the motivation or they or sometimes it's the thrill of having the money Did he actually need the money he was getting. Uh, like, what did he do for a living? If he's so intelligent, I was curious because that's the that nation. Help us out because I do not know the answer. I couldn't find it either. I couldn't find it. Um, but I would be curious. So if anyone in STS Nation knows, please let us know. Uh, talk about NJ Cool Chick. Shout out to my home state. Talk about paying attention to sig signs and signals. Who would sign up to be number six? It's six. It's horrific what he did. Do you think number five, number six knew that there was a one, two, three, four, five, Robin? Probably not. Probably. You know, as we've seen and we're seeing, you know, these people are fantastic liars. He is an extremely practiced liar, as we've been talking about the entire episode. He's got reps. You know, he's late 60s now. The guy has a life. He's been doing this since the 70s. He's got a lifetime of reps of deceit, deception, and living on the spur of the moment to create these, these situations in his life that give him short-term dopamine hits. And that's what he's been doing. Mm. Uh, Jersey Jen Castaldi, look at Detective Phil Ramos rolling with the punches. We want you back, sir. Oh, yes, we 100%. do. <laughs> One of our best guests, for sure. Um, he gets a, a definite pass uh, for, for this. Um Detective Ramos, I'm just wondering, you had to have experienced these extreme narcissists, um, you know, in the interview room over your career. How do you deal with them? Because they are, as Robin just said, they're so slick, so good at lying. Um, how do you deal with them from a law enforcement standpoint, just in the interview process? Well, you just keep giving them rope, more rope, more rope to hang themselves. You know, once you realize that that's where they're going, and a lot of times they'll do that in the walkthroughs. Um Yep. You know that what they're saying is going to come off as, what the hell is this guy talking about? So you just let them, let them go. Let them roll with it. Let them show just how out of it they are. And just let them keep talking. Just let them keep talking. And, you know, that old adage, giving, giving them enough rope, they're going to hang themselves two or three times. And hmm. you know that going in. So in the back of your mind, you ask the obvious questions that is going to entice them into being braggadocious about what they're doing or how much they know and just let them sink themselves. They're willing to do it. Let them do it. STS, we're going to have to get Detective Ramos on with Phil Waters. Both were undercover narcotics. Both had long hair. Both drive Harleys. <laughs> Got to get them both. Hey, Joel, do you, do you think that if they didn't have the walkthrough that they would be retrying this case? If they didn't have that walkthrough with him outlining and giving statements, do you think that they would retry it without the, the 404B Williams, without the prior charge? That seems to be their biggest case. Yeah, that's interesting. If he had hired a lawyer and didn't give a statement, and yeah. what would they have? Yeah, it's that's a good point. That's a good point. I, I, I don't think, well, I, I don't know enough about it to be able to speak intelligently about it, but here's the problem. Once that's in and it's admitted, um, yeah, just, just go with it. 
just go with it and let it and let him do that. Yeah. Why why he went along with it? That that's his ego letting him. My client wouldn't be doing walkthroughs. Right. I, I can't <laughs> think of any any attorney no. that would say, "Oh yeah, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. ahead, let him do that." And, and you hit it right there. The only thing that appeals to them and the toughest thing we did when we were strategizing on my behavioral team, how to do an interview of someone that's edging high up on the psychopathy is we kept trying to develop rapport and come up with strategies. And my psych would keep saying, you got to throw that report crap out. Psychopaths is just grandiosity, just grandiosity, just grandiosity. Let them talk, let them hang themselves. Yeah. Like you said, because that is the only people overcomplicate these individuals. They're not complicated. There's nothing there. It is literally just this high level of, of psychopathy going for the grandiosity. There's not a lot of thought process going on. They're literally reacting like a wolf in the jungle or a wolf in the you know tundra woods, yeah. whatever. That's that's interesting. Just let them hang themselves. Um, Tracy Jones, life would be so much easier if people just divorced. Uh, if life was so simple. This is a funny comment from I'm not T Pain. Uh, well, I mean, the movie The Hangover did not help Vegas's reputation at all. Uh, then the women are chiming in, which I love. Lorna McKenzie, uh, he's since cut his hair, but he is still revolting. <laughs> not Tim Jansen's hair. Don't cut that hair, Tim Jansen. Um, Tim Jansen, this was interesting. The defense uh, in these pretrial motions, uh, again, this probably happens. I can't imagine it being granted. They asked... Um, to exclude jailhouse phone calls. Um, what do you make of that? Um, that unless he's calling his lawyer, you waive it. You have no expectation of privacy. They tell you that when you uh, get into the jail. Uh, unless the lawyer is on it, then it's not. It's certainly admissible. I always mm -hmm. tell my clients, you know, I, I get a call and I say, hey, the cops want me to come down and talk to them. You know, or they talk to them. And I say, oh, let's, let's talk about what's happening here. And I say, listen, you're not going to talk yourself out of an arrest. You're only going to talk yourself into a conviction. Because if the police have you on their radar, they're not going to tell you what they have. And very few times I actually do go down there. And on I can count on my one hand where it's actually benefited. But most times it doesn't benefit. I'll call the officer and, and say, hey, man, is it going to make any difference? And he goes, well, I already got the warrant off. <laughs> I already got the warrant. So, but if he wants to come down here, so they think they can outsmart the police. And, you know, you can say what you want about the police. They do the investigation. They got witnesses. They follow stuff up. They usually go to this person either really quickly or they do a controlled call or they do it after they've, they've kind of got a feel where it is. You're not going to fool them. You're just not. And I, I've yet to find one that can walk into the police officers and convince them that they're fools or that they're not guilty when they did something doesn't happen. Um, Moto 88. Uh, sometimes what happens in Vegas ends up on STS. This is true. And it is happening right now. Uh, followed here by uh, Tali in Israel. I'm waiting for this too. The episode of detective Ramos, my biggest case. So detective Ramos, you are cordially invited. We do a series here called surviving my biggest case, which is what you probably thought you were coming on to talk about. We're going to get you on uh, to do an episode on that. That is not live. We'll tape it, and uh, I'll reach out to you after the show uh, to get you uh, to get your stories. I'm sure you have amazing stories to tell. Um, so, let's, yeah, uh, Detective Ramos. So, I'm going to kind of lay out this the sixth murder, which he's being retried for, uh, and get your take on it from a um, criminal standpoint. How they tried to carry out this crime. So, May eighth, two thousand and eight. Thomas Randolph, this guy, he calls 911 saying that his own wife, Sharon, had been murdered. Uh, he claimed that this, a stranger in a mask barges into his home and shoots her. Uh, but then he realizes that the stranger was coincidentally Michael Miller, a guy named Michael Miller, a handyman that the couple had hired to do jo uh, uh, odd jobs around their home. Uh, and Randolph says he then shot uh, Miller um, because he was scared. Um, promptly following that, he collects four hundred thousand dollars in life insurance. Um, just what about the mo here that he he befriends these handymen? Uh, he gets them to do a couple of jobs around the house, and then asks them to politely kill his wife, and then he kills them. Yeah, that's quite a leap to go from uh. You know, hey, come over here and, and uh, fix some plumbing. And, and while you're at it, I'm going to ask you to kill my wife. 
that goes to his state of mind, you know, or, or lack of it. I don't see that as being something that he can just play off as being, well, one thing led to another. No, the, you started your plan a was to get this person to kill your wife and you are doing that by befriending them. Um, and where he finds these individuals and the, I mean, you're taking a huge chance. So, you know, you're, there's a, a legitimate handyman comes over to work on your house and then, Hey, go kill my wife. Would you? Well, uh, you would expect this guy to say, you're out of your mind. I'm, and by the way, uh, you know, this job's on me. Don't worry about paying me. And, pick up the phone and call the cops and say, hey, this guy wants me to kill his wife. Um, what should I do? But it, it's, it's hard to say what he sees in someone that makes him think that he can trust them to the point where if I solicit them to commit a murder, you're not going to turn on me and call the cops. I, I just can't. I, I just can't. I don't get that thinking. And Detective Ramos, I wish I had the name, but a um, sharp detective in the uh, Las Vegas Metro Police Department, um, when they got this person got wind, and I don't have the name, uh, when they got wind of his past, uh, they turned their focus very quickly from a home invasion into homicidal husband. Um, how important is it in your investigating to look into, you know, obviously in the court system, you can't bring in prior uh, bad acts or bad evidence, but how important is it in your line of work to really vet this guy out, go into his past, look at wife one, two, three, four, five. Um, and how do you track all that stuff down? Uh, a lot of legwork, a lot of legwork. You, you, you do as much of a background on, on the person as you can and start calling every agency that you're able to call knowing where he lived, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or anything like that. If you have an indication that this has happened before, then you jump all over that. You, that that's your starting point right there. Um, and, and as we all know, in, in a murder, the first person you talk to and try to clear is the one closest to the victim. And in this case, this guy, I, I don't know how many wives uh, died not of natural causes, but <laughs> once you know that there's a pattern there, you go as far back as you can and, and work forward instead of starting here and going backwards, you go back and come forward to where you're at. Mm. It's critical, uh, absolutely critical in an investigation like that. And that's a good delineation. So again, four wives are dead. As you see here, Catherine Thomas, first wife, whom he has two children with, by the way, alive, Becky Galt. That's the one he was acquitted of um, dead uh, Gaina Alman alive, Francis Randolph dead, Leona Stapleton dead, Sharon Causey dead. Um, it's a lot of dead wives, uh, Robin Dreek. Um, what do you make of um, this MO? I just asked uh, Detective Ramos about to you, Robin Dreek, you know, that he would hire this hit, these uh, handymen, um, befriend them, you know, butter them up, and then say, oh, will you kill my wife? Um, and then Obviously, he was going in, uh, you know, for the kill on them to eliminate all the witnesses. Yeah, the state of mind is what we're curious about. You know, as Detective Ramos was saying, we also know that they said that I think the last hitman, um, there's there's hundreds of phone calls between him and and the guy also. So it's not just, hey, come in, no. fix my plumbing and I'm going to you know, ask you to kill my wife. Also. As the first guy was testifying that that got thrown out because the credibility was gone, they talk about how they were drinking together. We don't know what his mental state or psychological state of mind because of any kind of drugs or alcohol that's in a system when he's also doing these things and asking crazy things. And then he gets second thoughts and decides, well, I'll just kill him, too. I mean, there's there's a lot of crazy going on there. And I, I literally think it, he's still being driven by thrill seeking grandiosity because that's the main pattern going on here i don't think he likes the personalization of wanting to kill someone but he wants the money and the thrill of being involved in something big and cool like that in his own mind and so as the light of day hits it maybe it changes his mind on how he wants to execute it or not um so yeah i'm i'm with you on that the one who knows the state of mind when he's doing it uh, Tim Jansen. So let's just recap this first trial. So he was charged with two counts of murder for mm -hmm. Sharon Causey and uh, Miller's uh, deaths. Um, 
the trial didn't happen until 2017 and the murders were in 2008. Um, I could ask you the same question about the Markells and what's going on with Charlie Adelson. Why would it take nine years uh, to bring this to trial, Tim? Well, you, you never know. We had COVID um, and you, statute of limitations for murder. There is none. People comes up. Sometimes the police get lucky and they find evidence. Somebody commits another crime and they're looking at a lengthy period of prison. They say, hey, I want to I want to give you some information. OK, what do you got? Oh, I, I know about this murder. Oh, really? What do you know? You got any corroboration? Yeah, this is what I got. So it might have taken time for them to get information to move forward. And that happens. That happened in the Brian Winchester case that I had, as you know, with Denise Williams. That murder was unsolved for 19 or 18 years. And then my client was arrested for uh, kidnapping her. And then information was passed, and lo and behold, they solved the crime. But the Markell case, you're right. It, it's taken way too long. Um, and multiple trials, multiple defendants, mistrials, hung juries. Um, but it shouldn't take that long. But I don't know what, what, how long it takes in Nevada for the trials to go forward, what their dockets are like. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name other than Negus Afro. What is it? Afro Dane doll, sexy white men. I was trying to figure out if she's talking about us. Tim Jansen, or uh, she's talking about uh, Thomas Randolph and the guy. Thomas who, uh, Randolph. <laughs> I doubt she's talking about Thomas Randolph. Yeah, and I got my light blazing wow. on me. I had the wrong one. I got to put the other one on. <laughs> she is in Eritrea. Uh, that's amazing. Um, I'm blanking on his name right now. I know this weird facts. I know that someone made a documentary. There is the famous, uh, he's a marathon runner for the United States who is from Eritrea is like a six time Olympic winner. Um, I can't think of his name. It'll come to me, but anyway, he is from Eritrea. I'm sure Negus or Negus would know the name, uh, but welcome. We have not had anyone from Eritrea um, on the show. And look at this from Catherine Regier. Most importantly, mahalo Joel. We do live in Maui. We are safe, but heartbroken. The damage and loss of life is devastating. Uh, Catherine, I'll be sure to uh, reach out. Apologies that I've not been in touch. Uh, Meb, Meb, thank you. Meg, Meb, I, forget, I can't pronounce his last name. That's the marathon runner from Eritrea. The COE, the chief of everything, is on it. Um, Tim Jansen, back to you because this is legal stuff for a minute. Okay. Um, the state also brought in uh, the murder of wife number two. Uh, that was in the uh, original trial here where he was accused mm -hmm. of killing his second wife. Um, and they brought in Catherine Thomas, his first wife, and Gaina Allman, I believe the fourth wife, right. uh, to testify. Um, and they explained uh, that his odd and violent behavior uh, was something to behold. They witnessed it uh, firsthand. Um did I hear you correct that the judge is going to decide whether they will, will they allow these witnesses to testify again? Do you think in this case, as long as they're not discussing? I did not, I did not hear the motions on the ex wives. So I don't know if she made a ruling. I don't know if they filed a motion to keep that out. Um, that would be corroborated by their own testimony. They're probably going to be credible. It's pretty much re pretty remote. You said it's the first, not the fir first and third wife. So, is that what you said? So, that, I don't know how many more years they were married, but I think the it's the first. And, I want to say the first and fourth gets very confusing. I, I think okay. that the Williams, the four hundred four pa pattern, would include the wives' testimony. Um, so I don't know. Everything I've seen on the Supreme Court opinion was that this the hired hitman that's not coming in that wasn't coming in because it was improper prejudicial under analysis of relevancy probative value i don't know about the wives testimony and i didn't hear that as a pretrial motion hmm. so um detective ramos back to you because this goes to the crime uh itself and motive here so this fourth a second wife gets so confusing the second wife, Becky Gall, how can people get married so many times? I keep thinking of Johnny Carson, who obviously, as far as we know, never murdered anyone. 
Uh, <laughs> may he rest in peace. But um, so in the Becky Galt case, which is wife number two, which was brought in in the original trial, uh, there is yet another hitman, uh, a guy named Eric Tarantino, like Quentin Tarantino. Um, he tells a different story. He said that this guy, Thomas Randolph, tried to convince him to kill his second wife in a staged burglary mm-hmm. so uh, he could collect on the life insurance policy. And when he refused, this guy Tarantino refused, um, Randolph, this guy Thomas Randolph, beat the crap out of him, sent him to the hospital. He was much younger back then. And uh, this guy Tarantino just ended up leaving the state. Um that's really damning testimony, but this guy obviously will not be able to testify. Um, but what is what does that say to his character? If you're investigating this guy and you're now interviewing Eric Tarantino and Eric Tarantino says, look, I was asked to do this also, um, but I said no. And I got you know my ass kicked and I ended up in the hospital. What, what does it say to you about the suspect in question here? Well, just it just goes to his. His mindset on from way back when my question would be why didn't mr tarantino call the cops after he got his ass beat um you know for for whatever reason he chose not to but you know that could have put uh that could have put law enforcement in the game way before they did before they before they even were aware of this um and you know the other wives who that are dead you know what was their cause and manner were any of them a homicide or were they natural were they accidental once you find out that this guy's been married six times and four wives are dead man you got to dig into that and and you have to go with the the thought that maybe this the autopsy could have could have revealed something else had they known about the previous act the previous deaths and and how and why they died um, cause and manner death is is very important in a in a investigation because if the coroner says no this was a natural death you got no place to go with it i mean if the coroner says yeah this was a homicide and it was by multiple gunshot wounds then boom there you go take off running but if the coroner doesn't give you a cause and manner that you're looking for then then you're pretty much dead in the world and, and there's there's the uh cameo from windsor right there sorry about windsor <laughs> it's, all, it's all good we love dogs on the show. We get at least one dog barking a show. A very professional outfit this is. Um, Nightwood, uh, did he share all of his previous marriages with each one? Robin Dreek already said no way. Uh, John Moran here, I uh, just got married this year in Germany. The idea of seeing her hurt, I cannot imagine. But that, Robin, is probably because he's thinking uh, with a non-psychopathic mind. Um, Robin, I want to ask you, um, so this guy Tarantino, who was – asked to be a hitman for wife number two um when he began cooperating in the investigation um this guy thomas randolph allegedly tried to hire a hitman to kill him because he's now a witness speaking to investigators does that just build uh kind of a a mountain out of uh and you now have a giant real mountain out of what was once an anthill just to show you that this guy is truly crazy. Now he's going after witnesses talking to police. So we would think so from our optic here, but let's, you know, so let's do the thought experiment of being him. I know we can't because it's completely back ass word um, brain going on here with the broken brain. It's my friend, Chris behind, says, but what we have is, is someone, if we think about the fact that how did he get married six times? A, a master manipulator and someone edging up on psychopathy like this is really, really skilled at picking vulnerable people that he can manipulate. So that's not just with wives, but with people that he wants to hire as hitmen as well, you know, to Detective Ramos. Why didn't this guy go to the cops? Well, I think because this guy knows how to choose people that wouldn't go to cops because he knows, one, how to manipulate them and also pick the most vulnerable so he can just take advantage of them. And so I, I think his... I don't think he's conscious of it because, again, he's pure animalistic. He is just doing this. So he's picking really vulnerable people that he can take advantage of and manipulate into not doing these things. So in his mind, probably, I don't think he might think it's a risk because he's practiced at this. Mm. Uh, Shout out to Lisa Ribikoff, who is just on our show for the first time. We're going to have her back, a private investigator out of New York City, Long Island. 
uh, where the Long Island serial case, uh, killer case is going on. We're going to get back on that uh, midweek next week. Uh, shout out to Tiff Knox, friend of the show. Um, as the comments continue to come in, uh, someone saying, oh, dear, look at him now uh, talking about uh, Thomas Randolph. So let's go through these wives and then uh, get a couple of closing thoughts. But uh, each of the wives has they have some interesting tidbits. Wife number one, uh, Catherine Thomas. Uh, they had two wives together. They were married in 1975. She was just 18. He was only 20. Um, and um, Robin, when she testified in the first trial, she literally said he was controlling, manipulative, psychologically abusive. And at one point, uh, he threw a bowl of oatmeal at a wall because it did not have sugar on it. They promptly divorced in 1983. Uh, you're the you're the people formula, man. Uh, what do you make of this formula? I mean, is there no bottom for this guy? Um, you think that do you think if there was wife seven, eight, nine, ten, he'd be doing the same thing? hundred percent. So so when we look at it, those patterns of behavior, if we see a pattern of behavior with even three wives, let alone six, why would it change? So the only thing that changes someone's behavior is a new outside stimulus that causes a profound life event that makes someone change their behavior. You know, I was I was liking human beings to the Titanic, big ship, small rudder. So even a life changing event where you're going to change that rudder, it takes a long time to change that ship. And so without a profound event, why would he change his behavior? He's been getting away with it for a very long time. So I think it doesn't change. And it set that pattern of behavior was set very young very young age and he did a good job of hiding it and manipulating people to the next one until he got his next you know psychological dopamine hit mm. uh we're gonna go on to wife number two her name is becky gall uh detective ramos she was in fact uh murdered but he was acquitted of the charges so uh she died under mysterious circumstances i guess one would say uh listen to this she they were married in 1983 it was the day his divorce was finalized from his previous wife uh, I'm just going to stop it right there. Um, what's it say about him that he's getting married on the day his divorce is finalized? If, if, if you're interviewing him in the police interview room, what does it tell you? That's a big red flag right there. I mean, the day you get your divorce, you marry somebody else. Not only is it a red flag for him, but a red flag for the woman that he's marrying. You know, so uh, when did you get divorced? Uh, nine o'clock. Let's go get married. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. You know, that I, that gives you a really good idea of how far ahead this guy's planning his activities. Yeah. And I've got an image of all the uh, Vegas uh, chapels in my head right now. <laughs> but uh, just to continue on here, Detective Ramos, uh, police found her, Becky Gall, the second wife, tucked into her waterbed. Her death was originally ruled a suicide. He promptly received, guess what, a $500,000 life insurance payout. Uh, they later charged him with murder. And the reason they did is investigators, this is so weird to me, they discovered that Thomas Randolph was singing songs about killing his wife and had hired a hitman to kill her. And that hitman was one of you, Detective Ramos. It was a cop. So he had hired a cop. I don't know how this guy got off, but he was acquitted of this murder. Um, I guess he was singing songs to this undercover police officer who was being hired to be a hitman. I mean, this is really twisted and weird, isn't it? That's that's very weird. <laughs> and that happened here. So I'm going to I'm going to No, this one happened in Utah. This one happened in Utah. Utah. Oh, that was in Utah. Yeah, this one. Oh, okay, yeah. I thought that was I thought that was here. I was going to say I'm going to dig into the archives and because it was probably out. you, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been. It could have been. Yeah. Um, in fact, it, it, that time frame, I was deep undercover at that time. Um, you know, this man, this guy is just uh, such a target-rich environment for a a good psychiatrist. I, I I'm surprised that they're not chomping at the bit to get this guy into their into their office and just see what they can dig out of his brain um since we brought you on uh and you thought you're talking about a different case just real quickly if you can just tell us what was this case that you thought we were talking about what was your involvement um you were undercover for it is that right as a hitman yeah 
Yeah, it was um, <laughs> it, it was a, a woman whose husband was a uh, timeshare salesman. And, you know, knowing what we know about timeshares, uh, they make a lot of enemies. And I, apparently he wasn't sharing his wealth with her. And, and she wanted more money than he was giving her. So insurance, she took out a big insurance policy on him and she wanted uh, wanted it to look like an accident. But I, I mean, we went so far as to um, put a body in a trunk and pour ketchup all around the head and, and clothing that this guy wore and, and showed her, look, he's dead. There, there's your evidence right there. Wow. Um... <laughs> How long were you deep undercover for in your career? 12 years. 12 years. It was day in, day out. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. You ever have a, any, I mean, were you ever in a, have a, a gun drawn on you in that time? Things of that oh, nature? Yeah, just yeah. Oh, plenty of times. Yeah. Back, back then, <laughs> you, know, you remember the movie Scarface? Um, yeah. I ran into so many Tony Montanas and had cocked 45s put to my head by the Cuban. Mary Lito drug dealers that I, I lost count and they wouldn't hesitate to kill you. You well, know, we, we arrested so many of them and, and they were just, they didn't care because what they would inevitably, what they would tell us is, look, we, we got caught here in America, but there's nothing you can do to us that we didn't suffer 10 times more in, in Fidel Castro's prisons. I mean, American prisons are like going to the gym compared to where we came out of, uh, you know, prisons in Havana. They, they didn't care that they got caught here in America. Yeah, no, I live America. in Miami. I live in Miami. Uh, yep. I know these stories well. Um, yep. With these guests, Joel, you can't go wrong. Even if you would talk about food, it would be interesting. And that is for you're hearing it right now. I'm definitely going to get Detective Phil Ramos, if he's willing to do it, uh, to do Survive My Biggest Case. Let's just fly through these last couple of wives here, three of them. Uh, Gaina Allman, uh, she's wife number three. She testified uh, in the first trial um, and she, too, uh, she's the one who said that um, a bullet made a hole in her kitchen. Uh, Thomas Randolph claimed it was an absolute accident. She said her life was in danger. Again, Robin, I'm beating a dead horse here, but uh, I, it sounds like bad aim spared her her life. Um, maybe he ran out of ammo, but uh, I mean, this is almost um, ridiculous at this point, right? Every wife, same deal. Yeah, you know, as Detective, Detective Ramos was saying, these are what we call clues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just I, I feel for these women. They were really taken advantage of, manipulated hard. I hope they're getting the, the treatment they need to recover from this. Um, most of them have a lot of severe PTSD after events like this, especially when they come to light. Um, so it's it's horrendous. It's absolutely horrendous because these people are just a walking disaster with everyone they interact with. Yeah, I and, wonder uh, if the first and third wife had life insurance policies. That is, that's interesting because they're uh, probably that's why they're alive. alive. They didn't. Yeah. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe you know, he was. Just, yeah, go ahead, Robin. Yeah, I, I'm thinking. You know, because if you look at you know it's just something as recent as the uh, the Daybell Vallow case, you know, Lori, the only people that seemed to have the darkness in them were the ones that had life insurance cases. Everyone else, if you didn't have life insurance, you survived her and her cult. Um, so it might have been the same thing here. Yeah. Wow. Um, so back to you, detective Ramos here. So wife number four is Francis Randolph. I'm interested to get your take on this. So, uh, she died in April of 2004 and she died in the hospital. But what's interesting about this is her daughter, um, came out and said that Thomas Randolph would not let her, the daughter visit her in the hospital and also testified at the first trial that he had her cremated within 24 hours of her murder there's suspicion that maybe he went into the hospital and did something nefarious. Um, from an investigative standpoint, uh, once you have someone cremated, isn't it really difficult to go back and try to find out if anything untoward happened? Yeah, yeah. And in fact, it's almost impossible. Um, and the other thing about that is uh, there likely would not have been an autopsy if there's a doctor attended death, mm -hmm. if, if a person that that wasn't a homicide to begin with, like a gunshot wound or something like that. If, if a person dies under the care of a doctor, um, there's usually no autopsy. The, the doctor will sign off on the cause of death, and it could very well have been 
a criminal act that killed this person, but we won't know that because the autopsy wasn't wasn't conducted. Um, and and that that's happened a couple of times. People people a lot of people don't realize that that autopsies aren't automatic. Uh, on the obvious criminal death, they are. But uh, if you have a suspicious death or a, a death that doesn't appear to be natural, it's not automatically um, given. A, the body isn't automatically given an autopsy. Mm. Uh, this comment uh, sums it up. I don't understand how he had six wives. He's not even that good looking. I would say he's <laughs> far from that. Um, wife number five, uh, and then we'll wrap it up, Leona Stapleton. Uh, she was the fifth wife. She died of cancer. A uh, Very little known about her. Uh, she seems to be the only one, though, uh, who had somewhat of a, a sad but natural death. Um, who knows if he aggravated her so much that... Uh, you know, that's what prompted it. Someone up here said it's uh, usually all about money. Um, and uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know. Uh, but I do know that Robin Dreek is one of our best guests, best selling author, author of The Code of Trust. And it's not all about me. And Robin, your website is People Formula. Is that right? Yep. Peopleformula.com. Peopleformula.com. And the, and the uh, podcast is on when and where do they find it? Um, we're doing weekly now monthly cause I'm in the middle of finishing my next book, but it's called forged by trust forged by trust. What's the next book? Can you tell us? Yeah, sure. It's, uh, called Alliance GPS guiding principles for success about creating healthy, strong alliances and, and relationships in our lives. Not this mess, <laughs> not you all. <laughs> it's these people. It's like the antithesis of everything we talk about. <laughs> uh, this comment is interesting, Rob, and your final thoughts. Uh, I wonder if she died of cancer. You think that maybe she didn't. Uh, usually there's, uh, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, obviously cause of death on a death certificate. But uh, what what do you think ends up happening here? Do you think there's going to be enough evidence to put this guy away? So on her with the cancer, that's a hard one to kind of fake. Obviously, I think mm. he might have known about it. I mm. think she, he might have chose her because he knew um, that was going to be an easy death for him to collect on. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. See, it's, that's kind of obvious, Robin, but I would not have thought of it. I'm <laughs> kind of dumb, but that's smart. Um, Maybe. Building, Everything's conjecture on my point. Always. 100%. <laughs> building guy says that dude looks uh, mental. It could have been over anything. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, he's a crazy kind of guy. Uh, the man with the uh, beautiful mahogany that is famed Tallahassee defense attorney R. Timothy Jansen, who might be coming right back on Sunday night to talk about this Shiver case out of the Bahamas. I promised myself I was going to take Sunday night off, but since Tim offered, I might have to work Sunday night. I will let you know for sure. Uh, okay. I will tweet it out at podcast STS, but uh, Tim kind of consider it done. Um, Tim, the thing that frightens me about this case is now nothing can be brought in from the second murder, which really uh, makes a good case. I think Um what are the chances this guy could get off completely? After, by the way, he was on death row, might I add. He was on death row. It wouldn't be. Uh, could he get off, Tim? I wouldn't be shocked. He's got an acquittal in another case. Um, and they brought in the detective about him singing. Um, I guess the thing is, you don't want to be worth more dead than alive. Um, and this guy would find people that were worth more dead than alive. And he's found a way. I think he's really smart. I think he's narcissistic he wants the attention but i think he's trying to prove to everybody how smart he is um no really smart person would have done that walkthrough unless he had already in his mind figured out everything he was going to say how he was going to say it i mean he's calculating yeah and um hope the prosecutor and the officers can can get through it and a jury hopefully they got a decent jury uh, Olive Heatley says male version of Lori Daybell. Uh, Robin Dreek was kind of alluding to that as well. Uh, nothing to see here. How did he get off death row? Because the Nevada Supreme Court uh, ruled that he needed to have a new trial, which is why we're at where we're at now. Uh, I got to really thank Detective Phil Ramos, especially for the screw up on our part. I thought we were talking about a different case. Um, he is a retired senior homicide detective with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, 35 years of service, 15 years in homicide. He went deep undercover, infiltrating the Cuban mob. I've got to get him on uh, to talk about surviving uh, my biggest case. Uh, Three-time officer of the year, and he has lasted 
in Las Vegas from birth, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and he was also at Tupac's autopsy confirming his death. He has survived all his years in Las Vegas. Got to give him credit for that because that is a dangerous city. Um, Detective Ramos, uh, your final thoughts, uh, having been brought on a show where you thought you were talking about a totally different subject, uh, you were extremely insightful. But your final thoughts on this? Well, you know, we just got to let the criminal justice system do its do its thing, and and hopefully it'll it'll end up with a positive result for the prosecution, and this guy will get what he deserves. He's, you know, I'm sad to say he's gotten away with it, but um, we just have to trust in the justice system. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, well put. Uh, thank you, STS Nation. Love you. We'll be back tomorrow, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time with Detective Phil Waters, who was in Hawaii. We'll ask him about that, as well as uh, former FBI Special Agent Scott Duffy. Uh, Sunday night, I think we will be doing a show on the Shiver case out of the Bahamas. Um, and then there's a horrific case about a woman named Rachel Morin, who was just uh, bludgeoned to death in a state park. Uh, and it's a whodunit at this point. No one really knows. Her boyfriend has a rap sheet. Uh, he claims complete innocence. There's no reason to believe. Otherwise, uh, the person who found her, an interesting character. So we will try to examine that case come Monday night. Until then, love you, America. Love you, Virginia. Love you, Las Vegas. Love you, Tallahassee, Florida, and everywhere in between. Gentlemen, hang on one moment.